because you can see the pattern welding down the center of the blade here. Um, it is probably a uh, archaeological find dug up somewhere, whether it was in a riverbed or uh, some kind of a bog find or something, because you can see the deep pitting that occurs where there was enough oxygen to get to the material. Uh, the reason we have steel iron swords like this that have survived is that when they get in the ground, hopefully they fall someplace in what they call an anaerobic environment, someplace where the oxygen can't get it to it. On the table over there, we have another sword that's bronze and it's got a dark green, what they call patina on it. This one will have a black patina that you can see residue of all over the blade. So the iron or the steel will turn black and encrust. And hopefully that encrustation happens quickly because then it will kind of create a barrier to stop that oxygen from penetrating. That's why we get artifacts like this today. If I take a piece of modern steel, throw it out in the lawn out there and go back in 20, 30 years, it may very well have rusted to nothing. It's just dust, it's gone. You might find the uh, residual iron oxides in the soil or see the outline of it if you dug down like an archeologist would dig down, but there may not be anything there at all. So uh, it's one of the challenges of trying to understand uh, the early Nordic cultures is how much of that material has been left to us today, how much of it got reused. Uh, historical peoples are very good at one wandering around and saying, oh, this looks interesting, picking it up and using it again for something. Um, iron as a material, when you use it, can be used over and over again. It's much like gold in that way if it's pure iron, okay? Uh, once you add any kind of carbon into it, it becomes steel, and that carbon will start to degrade the material over time if you were reheating it and reworking it and reworking it and reworking it. You get what they call grain growth. There's ways to process it through heating and, and cooling cycles to reduce that. But those are all things we understand today on a chemical and molecular, or on a, a, a metals are a lattice. So it's like a, a big uh, a scaffolding setup, right? And so when you're looking at this piece, and you see these things happening uh, in there, you're always trying to make sure that that scaffolding stays strong and true to the piece you're working with, okay? If you have the iron scaffolding up, there's no carbon in the scaffolding, okay? If you have the scaffolding up and it's steel, there's a piece of carbon in the center of each square of the scaffolding. Does that make sense? Okay? Um, I'm going to lay this out. I mean, I'm just going to... Um, so what happens in heat treating of metal or when you want to make the, the steel hard is once that carbon's in there, right, you have that carbon inside that square, right, like this. You heat it up to what they call critical temperature, which is about 1400 degrees or so. I vary per the material exactly what's in it. And what happens is that carbon does what they call faces. It goes out and it's like encasing the square in the scaffolding. If I quench that, if I dip it in cold water or get it cool fast enough, and this needs to happen in you know, a second or two uh, it, it very quickly, then what happens is that suddenly freezes that carbon on the face of that square. So it's stuck like this, right? And it's very strong, you can't, you can't manipulate it, right? It's very, very fragile in the sense that if you put a lot of pressure on it, it'll snap and break. Once that's happened, that's hardened, okay? That's what hardening steel is, okay? Then you would temper it, okay? And the tempering is to relax that bond a little bit. You wanna relax it so that the carbon goes back to the center. You wanna relax it just enough so there's some slippage around there. So then it can kind of move around a little bit, right? And that allows you to flex the blade and not have it snap on you, okay? And they understood this. They understood that you could do this. Um, the monk of St. Gaul in, I think it's 832 or something, uh, was writing about the king of the Franks, uh, who was known as being a great admirer of iron at that time. And some uh, uh, Nordic uh, emissaries came down from the north and brought him gifts of blades, silver, and gold. He threw the silver and the gold in the middle of the floor and said, yeah, whatever with that, let me see the swords grabs the swords and he was known as being a giant who was super strong and undefeatable and, and all these things, right? 
But he takes the sword and he bends it all the way to the hilt, supposedly. And then lets go and the sword doesn't flex back. And he throws that on the floor and says, not any good. And one of the emissaries pulls his own sword and presents it to the king and says, I think you'll find this to your satisfaction. And he bends the sword to the hilt and then lets it bend back because his hands are stronger than iron, it says. And, and he says, yes, that's a good sword. You know, everybody look at this. This is the most valuable thing in the room. All that gold and silver is meaningless. This is what real, real value or, or, um, is in our society. So you can see they understood the fact that they could make things springy like that. Okay? But they understood it in ways like I was talking the other day about you don't have your understanding of the world like we do. Okay? They had no understanding of what a couple seconds was because they didn't have an idea, they didn't know what a second was. All right? They didn't know what a 1400 degree fire was because they had no way to just say that's 1400 degrees or 1450. If you listen to modern bladesmiths today talk, they're going to go, well, I'm using a 5190 and I'm taking it up to a 1523 temperature and then I'm going to let it relax and then I'm going to reheat it. it they're using lots of values and scientific uh, ways of looking at the world, right? The medieval smith is looking at it as in what's the color of my fire? What's the color of the metal I'm pulling from the fire? That's why a smith would work in a darkened area or at least not in direct sunlight because if you take a hot piece of metal and put it in the sunlight, you can't tell what color it is correctly, right? Um, so you would be working in those things and it was learned over time and they would transfer the knowledge from one generation to the next. And then they would use that to create and do the pieces they needed to do. Um, they learned that when they smelted the iron, turned it into metal, that they could kind of tell the difference in the way it looked when they kind of broke it up, whether it was higher carbon or just iron. Um, and so when you're taking that material, you're working with very minute individual elements. Uh, the iron, if you put in 1% carbon, it's steel. If you put in 2% carbon, it's cast iron, okay? <laughs> So if you go from having sword blade quality steel to a cast iron skillet in the space of 1% of carbon, okay? So they're having to control that and you can think of how difficult that must be in a sense when all you've got to go on is your natural ability to understand the processes you're going through from repetition and learning from your elders, right? Um, a way I, I explain it to kids often to understand is, do you guys know what chlorophyll, chlorophyll is? No, have you ever heard of chlorophyll in school? It's the stuff that makes the leaves green, okay? So when you study leaves, you know, that's why green leaves are green, it's chlorophyll, right? Uh, we understand chlorophyll in ways of, you know, what it's doing and oxygen and CO2 and all those things in a plant life, right? The medieval person is looking at those things and seeing that tree out in the yard in the middle of winter, it looks dead. There's no leaves on it. You know, the wind comes by and blows it, but it just kind of sits there stiffly and, and, and vibrates a little. But in the spring, it suddenly buds and the green leaves come out and it becomes alive and the wind starts moving it around more. And it looks like something has come alive in the tree, doesn't it? And then as we come to fall, it turns colors and kind of, kind of they get crunchy and they start falling. And then eventually it evolves into that winter tree again, right? Well, if I'm looking at the world and I don't understand any of the things that we do about trees, it makes perfect sense sometimes that something comes into that tree in the spring, enlivens the tree, creates the power of the tree, but then in the fall it leaves or dies off and will reborn in the spring again, right? It's a cyclical idea. All of those ideas are there in those cultures, but whether they explain it through chlorophyll like we do, or they say, maybe a tree spirit has come into that tree and created it. That's a perfectly um, realistic way for them to see that information being processed in their brain, right? They were just as smart as we are. We're still human 1.0, okay? We haven't, we haven't, nobody's here has got any cyborg implants that we know of, right? Maybe they do, maybe they do, okay? Maybe Roland when he's got a sword in his hand, <laughs> trying to figure out why he just hit you for the second time. Okay, but when we start understanding the world like they did, that allows us to penetrate their minds a little better than just looking at it from our perspective. Okay, 
Um, we understand these things on very minute levels in very specific ways. But we're still struggling with how thick were their shields on the edge. How good is that sword in a fight? Um, none of us are regularly practicing mortal combat to conclusion. That puts us at a different point in the process of understanding it than they would have had in their midlifes uh, being uh, Viking fighters. Okay? That's something that uh, is uh, hopefully something none of us ever have to experience. But we have to be conscious of that when we talk about this, we understand it, we appreciate the history of our own ancestors in ways that are meaningful to us, but also that we um, create realistic ideals of what they were trying to accomplish. Uh, we were just talking a little bit before I started talking about how, you know, what, what was it like for them in fights where there was larger groups of people fighting, you know? Was it just that kind of idea of how we would approach it? Or do we look at their stories and the things they tell us about themselves, about how they exemplify the way to act in those situations? Now, being human beings, nobody acts that way all the time, you know? We don't always live to that highest standard that we hold as a society of being great. But when we understand the societies that they had, where their uh, structural, elements of their society were designed about, we need warriors to protect ourselves. We need warriors to gain uh, the advantages in the, uh, the difficult and complex society they were living in. And how do, those war how do we want those war warriors to act when they are out there on the battlefield? How do we want those warriors, warriors to respond <coughs> in situations where it might be very, very difficult? Almost every warrior culture that we come across whether it's the dog warriors of the Apaches, the samurai of Japan, the Nordic warriors, uh, medieval chivalric ideals of, of warriorship, they evolve a way of perceiving themselves as having a mortality that may already be decided, right? That when I am confronted with a choice, if I'm a medieval warrior and I'm on the battlefield and I've got 3,000 guys coming at me, and there's only 10 of us, what's the right choice to make? Most of us being practical modern human beings would run, right? In the context of how those societies looked at themselves, the stories they tell us about what you should do at that point, most of them talk about making the choice that while they know they must lose this fight, fighting the fight is the right choice. Making the decision to stand is what they would have you do. The oldest story we have in the French language is the Song of Gold, is literally that story. Uh, when you look at the Nordic sagas, there are example after example of individuals holding a bridge or standing their ground against superior odds because it was the choice to make for their society that was appropriate. And so when we put ourselves in that context, we add the artifacts that we understand. We do the research that Asphalt and Roland have done over the years, trying to understand those things in physical ways, in mental ways. We can start to create ideas that will um, let us understand these people in, in a fuller context than we ever were, or that you know, social media ever gives us. Uh, you know, uh, it's much better to dive into these depths than to try and gain that knowledge through movies. Uh, <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? I kind of covered a huge amount of information there very quickly, and I'm, uh, I don't want to take up too much time because you guys got a class to get to. So, I've stunned you with the breath. Where, where did you get the swords? Um, well, the swords came from Ewart, and he collected in England. Uh, so. Uh, pieces like this were probably purchased on the private market. He's got a few pieces that he, he purchased at auction. Uh, when he first started collecting, it was, I believe, just before or just after World War II. And you could go to an auction house and buy a medieval sword for $100 or so. Um, today, that doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, but a, a piece like this, he probably purchased from a collector who acquired it from somebody that found it. Um, they did not have all the antiquarian laws that they do now where if you find a piece you should report it to your local archaeological authorities and things 
And that's for context. Um, this sword could tell us more about itself if we knew where it was found, how it was found, what was the condition of the find. That's very valuable information. Um, and you know, some some people today really focus on you know trying to preserve that knowledge for us. That's one of our missions. Is we're trying to, to take all the information we have and and coalesce that and keep it so that we don't lose it. Uh, pieces that are in the private market get moved from private collector to private collector. They'll have a tendency to acquire stories because sometimes it's easy to sell something if the story is good. Uh, or they get a tendency to lose the truth of what, what was and where they were found. Uh, and you see that happen again and again. But uh, today we found that um, you see that happening less in some cases and you see uh, people really working to preserve that culture uh, altruistically in a way that, that is very appreciated by everyone that, that loves these things um, for what they are. Um, and it, it's a, uh, a interesting way to learn about the things is to see the piece, handle the piece. Um, this is a modern hilt on here for everybody that, anybody that doesn't know. Uh, when he acquired it, he had just the blade, but then he had a uh, friend of his who was a craftsman to put the hilt on there. So when you are at the table and you put the gloves on, you can pick it up and feel how that Viking sword would feel in the hand. Uh, that, that was their mission. He and his wife had collected all these pieces. She was a early and very formative uh, educator in England and uh, created a whole system about experiential learning. Uh, you didn't sit in the classroom in her, in her class. You went outside, you experienced things, you saw things. And they were both very much about the artifacts telling us stories and understanding them that way than just going to the uh, museum and being behind a piece of glass and reading a small description of it and that's the only interaction with that. So how old is that again? This is probably, this was probably made eight, nine hundred. You can see the pattern on the correct? Yeah. Where would you do they think that was made? Um, great question. When you get in, who made Nordic blades? Uh, m many uh, people have always wanted it to be these, you know, Viking smiths of old, you know, and, and such. Um, a lot of the information that, that we have now is that, one, there was a good amount of trade going up and down in in uh, western Russia, along the, the rivers, the Volga. And so you have imports of high quality metal coming from uh, Central and, and Southern Asia coming up into those areas. Um, you have uh, the Smiths of Northern uh, Europe, Germany, uh, and, and Poland <coughs> being exceptionally good, the Frankish Smiths being exceptionally good at producing blades, high quality blades that we find all over the place in Europe. Uh, so while some swords may have been forged in the Nordic context, um, they, if they were, they were probably working either from imported material or possibly some uh, locally produced material, but the steely edges of the sword are probably always going to be the most highly sought after and the uh, most likely to be imported material. Uh, we don't have a clear understanding of how many swords were produced here, how many swords produced there, that may be unknowable to us. Uh, we have certain aspects where uh, we get some commentary on the blade themselves. Um, there's a, a, a doctor, an Islamic, or a uh, uh, Middle Eastern doctor in Afghanistan writing, is it 700s or 800s, talking about how the local warriors will go north to find the Rus' grave mounds and dig into them to get the blades of the Norsemen with their pattern of well their blades because they, high, they pride them so highly. These are the pe these people producing wood, which is also called Damascus steel. And they're going north to steal from the graves of the Nordic warriors because they like the blades so much. Um, we also have a commentary by another uh, traveler from the Far East who said, oh, the Norsemen don't really appreciate the Woots blades. They don't think they hold up very well in the cold weather. Um, so we, we see that they're aware of each other's blades and interacting in ways of 
you know, some of them have them or are getting them or some not and some going after them and things like that. So it, it was a much more dynamic idea of how those things were going on than I think we give them credit for in a lot of ways. Um, but just in the last 20 years, we've vastly changed the way we thought about those trade routes. Uh, Woods production in the, in the Middle East uh, where you have large areas of southern uh, southern Asia that were producing roots in the central plains area north of the Black Sea and things like that, where uh, we just didn't didn't give them that credit before. So suddenly an area that we were like, well, everybody just ran around it as fast as they could on the Silk Road. We're like, no, this was a major production area for metal, and it's probably what fed the sources of metal going down into Persia and then coming across in Damascus and then coming back up into Europe that way. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know, we're still figuring out a lot of those things. Cool. Do you want to share anything about the Institute? Or oh, um, yeah, if you're, if, if you're interested in the Old Shot Institute, we run programs. Uh, we have a summer camp, or a day camp for kids all summer long, or not all summer long, for, I think we're doing at least three weeks this summer. Uh, usually each week has a theme, so we're going to have a, a Viking theme, a medieval, early and late medieval themes. Uh, we usually do uh, we usually do a craft project this year. We're attempting to do metal helmets, and uh, the Viking one I believe we're doing shield, wooden shield. Um, we also teach important uh, skills such as javelin throwing, axe throwing, uh, how to work a shield wall, uh, things like that. Uh, every once in a while, we'll pull out our siege engines, and fire trebuchets, and scorpions. Um, so, you know, things that young boys and girls should know. <laughs> um, we also will do uh, interaction with the historical pieces, so the kids get a chance to do that. We go to schools and groups with some of the pieces to uh, do that and have an outreach to those. So we do things in libraries and, and schools around. Uh, we've taught a couple homeschool courses. Uh, we go to the University of Minnesota and give lectures. We go to high schools and give lectures. From everything from you know ancient Greek uh, elements to Romeo and Juliet and the sort of fighting that um, you know we have a vast amount of useless knowledge about combat. Um, uh, something coming up in uh, June. If you we do have a, a website, oldchat.org. If you check that, we will be having a drink for a cause at Northgate Brewery in Minneapolis. So if you show up and have a couple beers, we will get some of the, the uh, support from that. Uh, that will be happening in early June, so that should be a good time. Uh, and then uh, we are also always open to uh, people who want to help out, uh, come in, see, see what we do, and see if there's ways you could you want to participate or support us in doing those things. Uh, we're, we're all about trying to expand that knowledge of history for people uh, in real ways <laughs> to understand things. Are we planning on doing any more? Talks soon? Yeah, yeah, we just don't have the dates nailed down yet. So we, we had some things and then we were doing this and other stuff. So we, we need more people to do less. <laughs> and we have a Facebook page, right? Yep, we have a Facebook page too. Yep, Oak Shot Toto. That's the website. S H O T T, right? Uh, yes, yeah. O A K E S H O T T. Yeah, it's the English way of saying it. Any questions? I'll let you guys go. One question. I noticed you have like cloth looking gloves. Is there any reason you use those instead of like latex or something? Uh, latex or cloth would work the same. So you don't sweat as much in the cloth. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes latex gloves, but after a while you get a little slimy inside. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Thank you guys.